Good morning class, my name is Yu and today I'll be presenting to you on chapter 12 of the world-renowned book Why Nations Fail by Darren, uh, by Darren Asimoglu and James Robinson. This book is a famous example of, uh, that explores reasons of why some nations are rich while others are poor. They use empirical evidence to explain the state of poor nations. And in the case of chapter 12, they use the term extractive economies to, uh, to explain why some nations not be able to break out the chain of poverty. So what are extractive economies? Extractive economies are born out of extractive political institutions where the elite exploit resources within the country and more often than not, its people for their own gain. This has resulted in economic stagnation. So according to the book, extractive political, uh, extractive political institutions lead to extractive economic institutions which enrich a few at the expense of many. This is a common theme that you'll be seeing in the progress of my presentation. They often uh, provide no checks and balances against abuses of power and they often lead to civil wars. So now, we'll be exploring these four countries' history and to answer these four questions here. Okay? So for the first question, is uh, we'll be exploring the case of Sierra Leone, which explains how extractive institutions are created. So in the case of Sierra Leone, it was a British colony from the year 1896, and the British enforced indirect rule on them. But what's important to note here is that the, the, the British created extractive institutions that the new leadership after independence inherited. These extractive institutions include paramount chiefs, so that where they put local chiefs in charge, which created social stratification, and there was actually a significant amount of power to be gained from holding political office. They created a marketing board which forced farmers to sell their produce for a much lower price, and that was the exploitation, main source of exploitation for the Sierra, uh, for the Sierra Leone, for the British. And in the case of the diamond monopoly, they made sure that they were the only ones who were able to mine diamonds in Sierra Leone. And, for the, uh, and they actually created a real world road to transfer all these goods. However, what we notice is that after independence, many of these ex uh, institutions were actually maintained. For the Paramount Chief, they continued to be leaders of the country. The marketing board was made worse because it increased the taxes on the farmers. Diamond monopoly was nationalized, so now the in Sierra Leonean government was the only one who could mine the diamonds and the railroad was actually destroyed to prevent rebellion which set the country back even more. So this meant that uh, uh, this is a clear case where oppressive leaders inherited these extractive in, uh, institutions that were created by their predecessors and thrived greatly on them. So this is not a surprise why Sierra Leone today is a, uh, is a extract, uh, is has not been able to grow since independence. Even though you see a growth here, as compared to a country like South Africa, where there hasn't been an extractive institution, the, the growth is dwarfed. So now we move on to the second country of Guatemala, which answers the question of how polit extractive political institutions are maintained. So Guatemala is a, was a Spanish colony and which gained independence in 1821, and what we need to take note here is how that uh, elite min uh, minority has been ruling it since 1531. That is uh, significant because the extractive institutions were laid out by the, pre by the uh, Spanish conscriptors uh, in, in the 1500s and that meant that uh, even until today only 1% of the population or about 22 families rule the whole of Guatemala. And uh, this comes as no surprise that the top three ministers in 1993 actually came from two families of Spanish con uh, con conquistadors, uh, namely the Cardona family and the Castillo family. This meant that in order to maintain uh, extractive institutions, you need to keep the pool of elites small. small yeah. The third example is that of Ethiopia, which answers the question of why is it so difficult in abolishing extractive institutions. Uh, and the, the main reason is that even though Ethiopia had its monarchy overthrown in 1974, it faced a problem known as the Iron Law of Oligarchy, where the new regime that took over was as oppressive as the previous one, and that didn't allow economic growth in the country. This was seen by how in the 1970, after the 1974 coup, uh, the general that took over Selassie was actually a, a dictator and he himself was overthrown by Meng Su who, uh, who was equally oppressive and was, uh, was uh, uh, and stagnated growth in Ethiopia. This meant that 
so long the, the, the uh, so long that the, the leaders had power and the guns to use oppressive methods like their predecessors to maintain these uh, extractive institutions, they will be able to stay in power, making it difficult to overturn them. And the last example is that of the USA in post Civil War, which provided an illusion of change of extractive institutions. This was because in the uh, in 1863, although uh, uh, the slaves were actually declared free by Abraham Lincoln, and they were guaranteed compensation of 40 acres of land and a mill, black men were also given the right to vote. However, this, the reality could, be, could not be further from the truth, as even though there was abolishment in slavery, there was the Black Code Act which was uh, implemented, which was a forced labor act for black men. And the, uh, secondly, there was no actual compensation for the slaves and the right to vote was disenfranchised because there was a high requirement of both poor taxes and a literacy test, which the black people were not able to test. We were not able to pass and hence it was, dif uh, it was difficult to see how the lives of the blacks actually changed after the Declaration of Freedom. So in the case of post-Civil War USA, it was clear that even though there were promises of change that came with the end of the Civil War, where blacks were promised freedom, it was not exactly the case and th because of the desire for the ruling class to maintain this extractive institution. This has led the book to call for inclusive institutions where there's a law of the rise, allowance of the rise of the merchant class as seen in the Australian gold rush. It meant that their wealth was not concentrated in a few people and that it limited the gains in holding political office. That meant that there was an uh, incentive for, economies, uh, for the economy to grow and everyone would be better off. So this is just another summary of what we have discussed today. And if you'd like to find out more and you find this interesting, you can take a look at the book. I'll show you like it. Thank you.